Next, we're going to cover the union bound and how the union bound is the basis for developing equations that you'll find in textbooks for the, the performance of various modulation formats. Um, in fact, in our Sklar book, uh, the probability of error that we're going to be developing from the analysis of the union bound are found in these sections from the Sklar book. However, they do not really tell you about the human union bound and how they develop these equations. So what we're going to be doing is looking behind the curtain, seeing how this works, how you come up with those probability of error equations. And so the idea of decision regions and the idea of somehow exploiting the binary probability, I, that was all background so that now we can go on to the union bound and put these pieces of the puzzle together and actually develop the equations for the probability of error that are simply presented in the Scholar book. So that's why I say course notes. It's really uh, what you'll see today uh, that, will, that will tell you how, how the union bound is used in order to get to those probability of error equations. So I'm going to start with QPSK. I'm going to show you how the binary analysis can be applied to QPSK. And then I'm going to say, in fact, we can gen uh, generalize it for uh, larger constellations. We'll also have um, a way of looking at an exact probability of error with QPSK, which we can't do with general MRE cases. So uh, when we use the union bound, the union bound is going to give us an approximation. It's a bound. But then we're, from the bound, we're going to skip over, neglect some terms, and make an approximation to the true probability of error. And it won't be exact, but it'll be a very, very good approximation. And QPSK is interesting because we'll have an exact one we can compare it with and see just how good it really is. So QPSK, remember the definition. It has uh, four phases which are, are used. These are a modulation format with equal energy. We assume that we're doing maximum likelihood detection. Uh, and there are two basis vectors. It's two-dimensional space. And of course, uh, there are four symbols, so there will be four decision regions. And for this choice of rotation, the, ro the decision um, regions are simply the four quadrants. So very simple. So I have symbol one here in quadrant one, symbol two in quadrant two, etc. So four decision regions. When does an error occur? Um, an error occurs when um, we have um, the probability of error for when S1 is sent is the probability that the received vector does not fall in uh, this region. It does not fall in this region even though an S1 was really sent. So instead of falling in the desired region, it, it somehow it falls in this union. It either falls in this region, this region, or this region. So if I think of these three as being pushed together, that would be all of these. So somehow an error occurs when I'm falling in anywhere here, anywhere outside of this region, which is a, a S1. And so I can think of this as the union of these three uh, regions that the, the vector is, ends up falling in the union of, of this region instead of the true region. And that's why we call it a union bound, because we're looking at the probability that the received vector is falling somewhere in that union. So how do I come up with a bound? So I have a union, but now I need the bound. And the bound is I'm going to take this union uh, and do uh, a couple different ways of looking at it. So for instance, uh, suppose that instead of looking at each one of the uh, individual regions here, that I instead pose the problem a different way. And I say, suppose that there were only S1 and S2 available. If I only had S1 and S2, then the decision region would actually be a half plane. And an error would occur in this binary system whenever, um, although S1 was set, the received vector was in this half plane instead of that half. OK, so if only S1 and S2 existed, well, I know that problem. I've already solved that problem. And I just take the distance between the two. If the noise is greater than the distance over the two, I'm going to have an error. OK, so I know the probability of error. I'm going to call that P2. P2 means if there are only two symbols, what would be the probability of error? Um, so this would be the probability that R is not in this half plane region, even though S1 was sent. Now, I could do the exact same thing between S1 and S4. In fact, it would again be the same half uh, region. And uh, the probability uh, would be given by the separation of these two. 
because it's a binary system. I know that the probability of error is determined by uh, if the noise is greater than half of the separation. Uh, if I only had S1 and S2, uh, again, now it would be this half plane, which is at this 45 degree angle. And uh, again, I know how to calculate it. So the, the point is that each one of the times, I know how to do it if there are only two. If there are only two, it's real simple for me. So imagine that I said the true probability of error, which is a probability that it falls in one of these three, is going to be less than the sum of the probabilities for these other spaces. So think of it this way. I had three half, uh, excuse me, three half planes. And I have each one of these probabilities is associated with this half plane. Here's the half plane on the diagonal. So this sum here is the probability that I will fall in each one of those half planes, but they're, they're adding up, right? So they're going to be bigger than the real one. That's because if I do the sum like I'm doing here, certain parts are being counted more often than others. For instance, I would like to know the probability that it falls in, in these three quadrants. But when I do this sum, I'm actually taking, you know, this part is counted once. It only comes in that half plane on the 45 degree angle. But this part, this quadrant, is actually covered in each one of these decision spaces. So it's being counted three times. These other parts are being counted two times. So it's a bound because I'm, doing, I'm calculating a probability that's going to be bigger than the probability I'm interested in. I'm interested, does it fall in this area? And I'm adding up, you know, three times the probability it falls in this area, plus two times the probability it falls in this area, plus one times the probability it falls in this area. So that's why it's a bound. And you might ask yourself, how tight is this bound? How, how good is this bound? And it's uh, actually a very, very good bound. So here is another way of writing these three components, right? Because here it was uh, two half planes. Let's back up. These two are at the same separation, right? And uh, they, these two are the same separation. These are anti-diagonal, and they're a larger separation. So I know that the probability of error is determined by how long those distances are. And so essentially, I'm going to have two terms at the smaller distance and one term at the larger separation. So this equation, this bound, uh, this is the numerical value. And I know these because I've already done these calculations. I've already done the calculation of probability of error between two points. I know it's based on the minimal distance. I have the coordinates for QPSK. I know what the separation is, so I can put it right into this uh, union bound. So this is a human union bound on QPSK um, performance. You might ask yourself, how good is this bound? Well, this bound, if you look at numerically, the integration over, you know, this, what we want is the integration over these three quadrants, right? Well, if you look at the integration, when you integrate over all three, it's really numerically dominated by a region that's like really, really close to the edge of the um, uh, decision region. And so what we're going to do is we're going to approximate it as being uh, the two terms that are here, and we're going to neglect the other terms because they're numerically small. Why is this? It's because the probability of error is dominated by uh, small terms. Uh, by, by, excuse me, um, when the distance is small, the probability of error is higher. When things are far away, this happens much less often. I'm never going to, I'm not never, I'm very, very rarely going to get a noise that's so large that it pushes me way, way far away. Most likely ones are the noise that pushes me like just over the boundary. Much more likely, and so if I neglect these terms that are really, you know, hardly ever happen, I haven't much affected my performance, which is why I say it's an approximation coming from the union bound. Here it's a union bound. Here it's an approximation because it's no longer a bound because I'm throwing something away. And, and certainly if I was in a really um, bad signal to noise ratio regime, maybe this wouldn't be so negligible. But if I'm in anything reasonable, anything reasonable, this is going to be a close approximation. So that's how we get the approximation is we neglect terms that are farther apart than the minimum distance. So the approximation coming from the union bound.
So I showed you it for QPSK, and now I'm just going to give you it for uh, a larger constellation. And so this is the generalized union bound uh, for an MRE constellation. And it is based on the minimum distance. So remember the minimum distance, I take all of the two pairs. In this case, there were just the four and the two pairs. Uh, the minimum distance, there would have been a distance here, a distance here, and then the distance between this, distance between that. And the minimum distance is this distance. So I kept the one at the minimum distance, and all of the ones that were at larger distances, I neglected. And if you see here, there's a multiplicative term before the Q function, which was based on how many um, of the terms here in the union were covered by um, that same distance. So these two elements are what we keep when we look at the generalized form. So in the general of generalized form, the Q factor, what goes inside the Q function, excuse me, is the, the minimum distance. That's the one that really matters. There should be a sum with other Q functions, but we neglect those others. There is a multiplicative factor which is related to how many pairs are there at that minimum distance. If I go back to our QPSK example, there were two pairs at this minimization, what I, minimum distance when I was looking at S1. Of course, I should average over each one of the symbols, so I end up having this factor M. So K is the factor that represents the number of pairs of symbols by this, uh, separated by this minimal separation of D. So probability of error approximation determined by two things. What is the minimal distance? And how many pairs of symbols are there at that minimal distance? So in terms of the dominating numerical effect, it's much more dominant by date min, which gives an, uh, the, the exponential roll off to the bit error rate function, and less so, it's just a multiplicative function um, factor for the number of pairs at the minimum distance. So let's take a numerical example for QPSK because I said in QPSK we, we do have an equation for the exact probability of error and we can see just how um, good this approximation is that comes from the union bound. So again, we have already seen the coordinates uh, for QPSK. The minimum distance we found was two times the square root of the EB. And so if I look at the approximation coming from the union bound, I would take this and I would say the d min here, I would replace with this 2 times the square root of eb. That's where you see it over there. And then I would have to um, put in m, clearly m equal 4. And the next thing I have to do is count the number of pairs at the minimal distance. And you can see here I've counted them, s1 and s2, s2 and s3, s3 and s4, s4 and s1. Those are four pairs that are all separated by the minimum distance, so my k is equal to 4. So this is how I came up with this uh, approximation. Okay, so we went through the example QPSK, we got this directly. Now I'm starting from the general formula and I'm showing how you the general formula collapses to that same, same case. Now, this is um, the actual union bound. When I keep the terms, I have not neglected a term. So this is truly a bound. This is the approximation coming from the bound when I neglect this term. And now there's also the exact probability of error. And uh, due to the symmetry of QPSK, usually it's very difficult to uh, do the integration of the Q function across, um, of the probability density across uh, regions in a plane. Usually very difficult. However, you can sort of exploit the asymmetry of QPSK to come up with a, a clever way of coming up with an exact expression. This is the exact expression. It's this factor of 2q that we see here in our approximation, here in our bound, but instead of adding a term, we should actually subtract and it's a squared q term. So take my word for it, this is uh, the true probability of error for QPSK. And so now I'm just going to look at numerically, how good is this approximation that we use coming from the union bound? So first I'm gonna start with uh, signal to noise ratio of 0 dB. What does that mean? It means the noise is just as big as the signal. <laughs> that means if I looked at a cloud, the cloud would be as big as the separation between two points. So it's like a whole lot of noise. <laughs> In this case, suppose I looked at the uh, upper bound. So the upper bound would say that the probability of bit error would be 0.1596. 
okay? That would be, uh, you know, a gross upper bound. Now I say I'm going to neglect a term and I'm going to get an approximation. It's no longer a bound. Uh, and of course I'm throwing something away so it gets smaller. It's 1.57. And then I say what is the true value? And the true value is even smaller. It's 1.51. So you can see in the third uh, significant digit, it's pretty different. The third significant is 1, 7, 9. Okay, so you think it's pretty bad, but this is a terrible signal to noise ratio. This is not one you would ever see in a communication system. It's just like too difficult to communicate in this situation. So let's look at 5 dB and 10 dB. 10 dB is starting to be something I can deal with with QPSK. Um, so this would be like common. Even this is terrible. So you can see how the performance is getting better, of course, because I'm getting the signal to noise ratio. Remember, the bit error rate in general is a water call, waterfall curve, bit error rate, signal to noise ratio. The stronger the signal to noise ratio, the better the performance. Here we are at 0 dB, which is like terrible, you know, way up here. And then as I'm getting stronger, of course, the bit rate, the bit error rate is going way down. But the interesting thing to note is that now we're getting into, uh, what is it, the uh, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, fourth, sixth uh, significant digit at, at 5 dB. And by 10 dB, you know, uh, we're, you know, it's, it's a very, very small difference uh, between the uh, probability of error for these exact, the bound, and the approximation. So, even though I'm neglecting a term here, I'm throwing this away, you can see I'm not throwing much away. In fact, you can't even see the difference between that neglected term. That term is so small, the one I'm neglecting in order to make an approximation. It's almost, it's not visible in these many digits. And then if I look at just the difference between the exact value and my approximation, they're really very close. And as we get farther down here, the difference becomes smaller, 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 it's insignificant. So the union bound approximation is an excellent approximation and not just for QPSK. It's really uh, based on this D-min being really the important criteria and that um, uh, other distances which are larger uh, have m minimal influence on uh, performance. So this is uh, again the general union bound and what's nice is it applies to any geometry we want, we can use it for not just QPSK, not just QAM, um, but any modulation format because the basic principles are the same no matter what geometry we look at.